Hi everyone, Raphael Harry here, and you're listening to White Label American, a podcast where we hear stories from an immigrant or two, sometimes more. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to another episode of White Label American. Thank you all for joining us today. Before we begin, I'd like to thank my patrons. Shout out to Nicholas, our newest patron. Thank you for keeping the love. Thank you for supporting us and helping our team grow. Don't forget to invite your friends and loved ones to join us, help build our community. You can also support by buying our t-shirts in your favorite color of choice at vetclothing.com. You also be supporting a black owned business and a veteran owned business too. For those of you who at this moment aren't able to financially support, you can still help us grow by sharing this episode on your social media, along with dropping five stars and a positive review on iTunes slash Apple, you know, iTunes or Apple. Your support is appreciated always 24 seven. So thank you. So now, we're going to jump to today's guest. I have a very, very special guest coming from uh, my background, someone who has known me for a long, long time, and we lost touch over the years. But thanks to technology, we've been able to reconnect. I am honored to have Dr. Olufemi Adigun, who is a professor at Durban University. We were classmates at Mount Olivet Grammar School, Ibadan. And, um, you know, I'm very tied to Benin City. I always talk about Benin City on this podcast. But I left Benin City after my junior secondary, which is junior high school here, and moved to Ibadan. And I was an angry teenager. I didn't like it, you know, because I was missing the, the city that I really made my connection to. But Ibadan was another chapter of my life. And uh, Dr. Adigun here is one of the people who, I went to school with, and he got to know me, and it was, it was a different time, different time, funny time. But I'm glad I have him here because this man has made a lot of strides. He's grown. He's made a whole great, a uh, lot of achievements, and um, it's, it's just a huge honor to have him on the podcast. So welcome on the show, Molufemi. Um, how are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you, Harry. Good, thank you for having me. Oh, you can come, just call me Raphael. Call me Raphael. You no need to go, Harry. Harry. Maybe you keep reminding me like I'm in the military. I'm not the Navy again. Okay. <laughs> so let's begin from the very beginning. So should I should I go with Prof or should you want me to call you Olufemi? Which one you want? Olufemi is fine. All right. Okay, Olufemi. You want to tell us your place of birth and what your childhood was like? Yeah, thank you. Um my name is Olufemi Adigun. Um, I was born and bred in Ibadan, Nigeria. The Ibadan is the largest city in West Africa, so to say. Uh, precisely, uh, Oyo State, Nigeria, Ibadan, Oyo State, Nigeria, in the early 1980s. I went to a couple of primary school before going to Mount Oliver Grammar School for my high school oh, no, no, uh, Don't, don't jump to Mount Oliver. Just let, let's stay in this almost more face. I mean, let, let's, let's stay there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you, you were born in Ibadan. What, 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 yeah. what was growing up in Ibadan like? What, what, what is Ibadan? For, it, for those who don't know Ibadan, what, what was your uh, area of Ibadan, you know, what was that part of the world like to you? There? My part of Ibadan was, um, I lived in between Ibadan, not local government and Akele local government. Oh, okay. uh, that's where we have the, the premier university in Nigeria, University of Ibadan. Yes. Uh, I lived around that side. My growing up was majorly uh, wrapped around students of the University of Ibadan and uh, students of the Polytechnic Ibadan. You know, and my growing up there was um, quite a kind of rough because I would say I live around um, a, a low economic status 
uh, the class of lower socioeconomic status of group of people. And um, my growing up was just so rough, just so rough. Things were difficult, but, you know, with um, resilience and tenacity, we were able to scale through and um, we managed to escape the childhood uh, calamities. So before I go further, I actually should have started with this question. You have two beautiful names, Olufemi Adigun. What are the meaning of your name? Yeah. Olufemi means God loves me. While Adigun is an ancestral name, that means every agreement comes to pass. Every agreement comes to pass. Nice. Adigun. There's no way you have Yoruba names that they won't have meaning. Yeah. So there's no way I have yeah, sure. to ask those questions. Every agreement comes to pass. And I love that. I love that. Mm. So um, you grew up, you were born in Ibadan. Um, childhood was a little bit rough. But even with the in, the, in those rough moments, you still have memories or you still have times that were of how will i say it, joy or of fondness to you so looking back to your childhood Ooh. what would you consider your favorite childhood memories well what i would consider my favorite childhood memories were playing balls playing soccer on a stony grassless pitch <laughs> you know, playing soccer, monkey pose, and we use our sandals as uh, five five feet pole. You know, you play with your colleagues. You wouldn't care of who who is watching you. Yeah. You know, or then we play we play ping pong oh, on a small tennis. bench on mm, small any, bench. Any surface, man. With, any uh, surface everywhere. <laughs> I don't think I played, uh, by the time I came to Ibadan, I don't think I, I, I played uh, ping pong like I played in Benin City. Because, man, that we, <laughs> we're obsessed with that. At one point in time, ping pong was even more yeah, popular than pong. playing uh, football. Football, yeah. yeah football. Was, and again, I think during my childhood, another thing that I can't really forget was the fact that we play um, this rubber band you throw rubber band, uh -huh. and the longest person we have it. We have the rubber band of other colleagues. Oh, oh, oh and I think I know, and I know the one you're talking about now. So it's like you have your own yeah. color, and then you have uh, Col yeah, red. you have your color green, yellow, yeah, yeah, then red. You throw it the fathers, the likes. yeah. The fathers said you pack the. Yeah. <laughs> you win. <laughs> Yep, I remember that game. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what that game was ever called. I don't know the. Official I don't name. know the name too. Yeah, I don't know the name. Too. <laughs> I don't think that game has a name. <laughs> I don't. I don't even know the person that came up with that game. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is that we just yeah. Every, everywhere I've been to, every, people play that game. Kids play that game mm. everywhere. Yeah, you just see yeah. rubber bands coming out, and it's just like. Yeah, we just it's like we just know <laughs> it's mm. a secret language. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So when you play football, what position did you play? Eh, the majorly I, I usually be the keeper because I I try to safeguard my sanders so that some nobody <laughs> will pick it up. Uh, that, that was a smart strategy. <laughs> uh, so, um, by the time I will, you and I will cross paths, you had already been mm. at Mount Oliver Grammar School for about three years. Because I, I, I joined. Yeah, I got this. Yeah. One. I was there in JSS one. Now we call it grade seven. There about. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. Now they call it grade. Okay. One one thing that happened um, while we were in secondary school, final year, you know, I, I was made punctuality prefect. Uh, I was. Well, there were two punctuality prefects. Yeah. Uh, Matthew. 
I can't remember yeah. his last name. I know it was first name was Matthew. Uh, you were you were you also one of the prefects too, right? No, 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 I wasn't. You wasn't because um, I left. I left in uh, I left Montolivet for School of Science in oh. um, SS one, but I came back in SS two. So by the time I came back, they were already at a point of selecting the prefects. Though I was I was nominate, nominated, but um, because of my absence from the school for about one year plus, yeah, I wasn't shortlisted. Oh, I, I always thought that you were one of the prefects. I don't know. I, well, I can't remember who everybody was a prefect, except myself. All right, but it's, it's been a while. It's about more than 20 years ago. Oh, yeah, it's been more than 20 years. <laughs> So, I've, I, 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 I need this, uh, this, so this. This is a question that doesn't really involve your side of things, but I'm just curious. Around the time that I came to the school, what, yeah. what, what do you remember about me? Seriously, it's just the name that kept ringing bell. And um, I think there was a day, there was a day, there was a day, an event happened on, under the mango tree before the principal's office. That got um, Akim Raji, yeah. Um, I think I think Fatai Shola and a couple of people been punished on the assembly ground. And um, he, and at that point, being a punctuality prefect, I think some people escaped from kneeling down. So those people that came late escaped from kneeling down at, towards the uh, field. So they rush into the assembly ground. And you were busy looking for one guy. I've forgotten his name. Um, um, Israel. His name Israel. Is, was Israel. Hey. Israel. Oh. I think Israel. I like you come or something. He used to smile a lot. I think so. I think so. Wow. You I'm know, <laughs> you, you came into the assembly ground that very day. You were curious looking for him. Looking for him. Shouting, Israel, Israel, Israel. <laughs> You know, that wow. that memory, you know, <laughs> I can't, you know, I can't forget it. I can't forget that. You know, the event that happened that day under the mango tree. That's one major event I can't forget. Though I, 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 I knew where Israel was, but you know, nobody could say this is him. Or this was him. <laughs> yeah, let me be looking for <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! Bless you. That is, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm trying to recall that. So wait, 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 was Israel like SS two then, or was he SS one? I think SS two. Oh. SS two. I, I think SS remember. I, I knew there was one or two juniors that I gave hell then, but I, yeah, I, I can't recall. Sure. <laughs> I can't recall chases and what that. Yes. And that's um, more than 20, about 22 years ago. <laughs> that is, uh, that's so funny. <laughs> well, Israel, wherever you are, I'm no longer looking for you. Don't worry. It's, you're safe now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's fine. <laughs> oh, man. That, that is... Uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's one chapter of my life that I just... Completely forgot about after I left the Badon. I just sure, to... sure, sure. Sometimes you so, forge ahead. Uh, so, but sometimes it's like, wait a minute, what really happened there? I like I remember, yeah. I, sometimes the power got to my head. I'm not gonna lie, it got to my head. And I had hair there too. I had my my punk, my square cuts, you know, my Bobby Brown or MC mm. and my hair cuts, depending on who you ask. And then <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I overdid it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, power, 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 power is something. Oh man! <laughs> so, when did you start to um, figure out, like, you know, you know, because uh, when did you start to think about what you wanted to do with your future, was it after you left Mount Olivet, or was it while you were in Mount Olivet during your final year, or? You know, because you 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 went the path, you decide you you went you you are now an educator, but when yeah. did you start to you know embrace this path and you know you know like this is where I'm going to go? 
Well, that's a long story because as a science student in high school, I every dream of a science student in Nigeria as I then is that I want to become a medical doctor, I want to become an engineer, a pharmacist, mm-hmm. and the likes and all that. Well, you know, as fit we have it, um, my school living certificate was not too fine. I had to have some receipts. Mm. So when I had our receipts, um, my father could not have afford to buy me uh, joint admission matriculation board uh, examination. Which is like that our SAT, form. SAT over here. Like SAT, yeah. Mm-hmm. Could not afford to give me the form, so I couldn't register for it. So one of those days, my father was on his way to Bumosho, to where we have uh, Lautec University. So he branched at uh, Federal College of Education Special. And then he said, he just got there and said, uh, I think this school will be fine for my son without my consent. So he came home, told me to fill the form. I filled the form. Though I didn't, I was like, what is this? I've never heard of this school before. Never heard of it. So, so when I got there, I discovered that, oh, it's a special school for learners with disabilities. The school actually trained teachers for learners with disability. So when mm. I got to, do, to the school, I was so disgusted. Like, what is this? Mm-hmm. What? You know, I saw people on wheelchairs, students on wheelchairs. I saw students on... I saw deaf students talking with their fingers. I saw students, deaf blind students walking with their white cane. You know, I was pissed off. I was pissed off, like, what is this, you know? At a point, I just have to put myself together that what is the, what is the, um, what is behind this talking finger? How come? I was curious about how people could be exchanging communication via manipulation of fingers, hands, fish. And so I, then I pick interest in deaf studies. Okay. Then I combine deaf studies with biology. So that was how, what I did uh, when I graduated. So while in secondary school, I never f- figure out anything because right there, there was no mentor. There was nobody to guide in secondary school. Hey, you're not alone, just, man. You're not we alone. We're just going. We're just going. True. Well, so but I think I started to reshape. My life started to be reshaped um, when I got into the college, um, college of education special at Oyo. But that was when I discovered, well, this is the part I have found myself. Let me just stay there and I'll make best out of this part. Mm. So, yeah, that, 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 that point you made about, you know, secondary school, there was no mentor. No, but like, I didn't even know the word mentor. I didn't even know that <laughs> word until, until, it was until I was in the Navy. Yeah. <laughs> I will find out that, uh, yeah, mentorship is something that um, a whole lot of us have been. Mm. It's, it's a word that exists, and we could have used that word, you know. And a lot of us indirectly were, you know, we've met people who've been mentors in our lives without realizing that they were mentors. But exactly. You, but when you don't know what to, you don't understand that relationship that like it should exist. That's how you. It's easy for it for many of us to get exploited. Because it opens that door for people to exploit you. Mm. Because yeah. if, if you know, if you have been, if it, um, if it has been explained to you, or <clears throat> excuse me, if yeah, we have a picture of this is how a relationship should work, where someone is showing you the ropes, school, in school, or out of school, whichever. Yeah. It prevents a lot of exploitation that happens in our society. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, so it's very good that you raised that point because I, I was like, oh, I'm not a science student, so I'll go beyond the art side. On the art side, we didn't have history teachers. We didn't have can you imagine? subjects. We didn't have people. Yeah, <laughs> I remember can you imagine? at Mount Olivet. Yeah, <laughs> my last two years at Mount Olivet, there was no history teacher. There was no arts teacher. Um, yeah, there, there was no, nobody for, for a bunch of subjects. Uh, geography was um, one NYSC. 
Yeah, um, yeah. One NYC lady like that. Yeah, lady. the lady came and all of us liked her. She was beautiful. So I was, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no. yeah that, that, that was it. And then when our service was over, she was gone. No, Nobody. So, yeah. yeah, so we missed out on a whole bunch of relationships that uh, could have helped. And then later on, we are not playing catch up. So all, all these things mm. tend to add up and, you know, it's uh, something that becomes damaging because if the, the right if you don't meet the right people at the right time later on it's difficult to recover what you've lost you know so from uh Lautech, you still went forward with your education yeah from from fc special lawyer yeah from federal college of education special lawyer yeah i went to university of Ibadan um as a direct entry candidate so instead of me, I spent three years at the Federal College of Education Special, Oyo, oh. where I obtained the National Nigerian Certificate in Education. So after then, I went to the University of Ibadan as a diet entry candidate. So instead of me starting from year one, yeah, you, you I started from year one. two. Okay. So now my, my, my question on um, UI, well, it might still relate to... Um, your um, college of education you also got involved in student activism yeah while in very well uh, um, in college and when you mentioned your childhood being around university of ibadan you know being around mm. students did that play a role in introducing you to student activism that you enter yes. later on in life yes very well very well because then while i was in nagbo you know student activism in, at the university of about the day was very sound that was where we have um people students unionism that will confront the management they will talk to them like yes i am the student leader um this is what we want this you know they come around Agbo and I have them around Akim, student union president, student union PR of the University of Ibadan. So all those things I saw in them, the way they, they the way they, their charisma, yeah. the way they the relate way they with people, actually, yeah, actually made me <laughs> think um, but yeah, I need to, I need to go into students' unionism. Though it influenced me, though basically, I think what made me go into student activism at the Federal College of Education Special Year was one day, um, I was about to do student registration for this particular student union. And the, the guy that I paid to, because we paid in cash, yes, collected the money from me and used my money to buy puff puff for a lady. <laughs> you know, I, I was crazy. Like, uh, are you for real? What kind of nonsense is this? I gave you money. Instead of you to drop the money in the association account, it's in right in front of me, you bought snacks for a lady with my own money. That, that is, uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, that, I care less really, if he was going to refund the money. Right there. I care less if he was going to refund the money or what. But because the real cash that I gave to you, gosh, you know, then I said I will do student unionism in this in this on this college, in this college, and I will try to correct some of these anomalies. Hmm. So, so what, what offices did you hold? While in college, then? Uh, well, I held a couple of offices. Mm -hmm. I was a public relations officer of um, Association of uh, Education of Students with Hearing Impairment. Then I was the General Secretary of Science Student Association of Nigeria, SAN, wow. Federal College of Education Special Year, and a so, couple of other activities then. I was member of the Student Representative Council at the college. So how, how did you okay. combine all this with your own studies and pursuing your goals while in college? And, you know, were there any time you, your class, did you, did you um, were there any time that, that you clashed with management or even government? Yes, 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 yes. Government yes. didn't like students 
talking to them. I, 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 I had clash. I had clash with management <laughs> in 2003 or 2004, 2003. Yeah, because then the the school brought out the list of those who are going to retake courses or repeat a particular level. Yes. Two weeks to two weeks to exam, first semester exam of the final year. Then you expect them to go back to the previous class. And I was like, this is not possible. Wow. We have spent two about 14, 14 weeks. You didn't bring out the list. Mm -hmm. Now exam is in the next two weeks. You are bringing out the list that these people must repeat or go back to retake some courses. And they must do registration within 24 hours. So that was why we uh, we converged at um, the Student Representative Council building, and we took a decision. In fact, I was the one that made the move that we should go on peaceful protest. So unfortunately, the management of the school did not handle the case very well. Instead, they, they came uh, against us with uh, securities, and they were taking pictures of those who were on uh, the peaceful protest. And that was how the students got angry, started throwing pebbles, stones, breaking uh, car windscreens and all that. And that actually led us to about uh, four to five months uh, uh, off away from campus because the school was shut down for about five months. Wow. Although we faced disciplinary panel mm -hmm. set up by the then Federal Ministry of Education. And I was among them. Uh, in fact, the Nigerian Television Authority uh cover the event i was invited to the panel of inquiry and i told them my start uh, my my side of the story well amongst those people that were suspended or rusticated i wasn't part of it because at that while the protest was going on some students were trying to vandalize yeah. and at that point i was trying to prevent people from vandalizing school equipment. At a point in one of the videos obtained by, from the Nigerian Television Authority by the panel of inquiry, in that video, there's a place one of the students smashed a wood on my head wow. because I prevented him from, you know, destroying from the destroying, school property. Uh, property. So, so, so you, you know, got, so you so, got attacked and injured for that. I got attacked by the same student. Even so, though you were fighting, and, um, you were the one for, you were fighting well, like, for them. Uh, yeah, we were fighting for them. The students are destroying school property. And I told them, no, 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 don't do this. We, the student will still pay. We are the one that yeah. is going to suffer. It. Don't destroy mm -hmm. these things. So at that point, about one or two occasions, um, some TV stations caught me preventing students from doing that. So at that point, I could, got a commendation from the management that at least I tried preventing people from destroying school properties and all that. Wow. Finally, I was um, excluded from those that were punished by either rustication or suspension. So how, how long did the whole process take? Because I'm asking this question because um, I've forgotten her name. I just remember this uh, woman who University of Illorin tried to stop from graduating one time and she sued and it's taking almost 14 years for her to finally get her degree. Yeah, yeah, that lady. I read her story yeah. that graduated from the Nigerian law school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the process then for our school took about five months. Five months, yeah. And could you take classes while all that was going on? No, this the entire school was on shutdown. It was shut oh, down. Oh, so it was while the school was shut down. They, they, they held the trial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they held the meeting. Yeah, the trial. Hmm. Man. Yeah, that's 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 why I'm like, yeah, student union. I don't know what it's like now, but yeah, the, yeah, no student unionism in Nigeria is like uh, activism is. Yeah, it's it's not for everybody. I just say that it's not for everybody. It's not because. Look at that. You were, you were fighting for students' rights and you still got hearts in that. Like, man, I'm, I'm glad sure. you made it, but it's, yeah, that is. So did, did you, did you, um, with, with, with you being hurt from the fighting for students' rights and standing up for students, did you ever lose motivation to continue the no, fight? No, not at all. 
Not at all. Not at all. Even till now, I've never. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So um, we are going to take a quick break and we shall be right back. And when we come back, we shall focus on your um, journey outside of Nigeria and then we'll still come back to Nigeria. Hi, everyone. Your host, Rafael Harry here. I can't believe we have gone past our one year anniversary of doing White Label American. I've had the privilege of speaking with some amazing people, sharing their modern day immigrant stories. And you've allowed this Nigerian immigrant to share parts of his immigrant journey through this podcast. Also, one of my goals of this podcast is breaking down artificial walls that keep people from getting to understand each other based on your wonderful feedback over the last year i think we have done a decent job in breaking down some of those walls we would like to continue and expand on this mission but we need your help i've had an amazing time creating and producing episodes for this show largely on my own we have a lot of ideas for new and exciting content to expand upon the mission but we need direct support from you our listener which is why we have created a white label american patreon page where you can make a one-time donation or become a sustaining contributor where you can get access to exclusive content help me interview upcoming guests by submitting questions and even have the chance to sit down with me for a one-on-one conversation either virtually or in studio so if this podcast means something to you and if you really love this show think about becoming a sustaining contributor and donating by going to patreon.com slash white label american pod Thanks for listening and for the privilege of your company. So welcome back, everybody. Thanks for staying with us. So, Olufemi, you went from student activism to being the man teaching the students. Exactly. How, how did that, you know, what, what made you become that man like i'm going to teach university students i'm going to be a lecturer i'm going to be you know was it because of the evil that you had seen or was it like you want to change like what like what when did you decide that you're going to be a, the guy like you know i'm not going to be at secondary school or primary school i'm, I'm going to be at university level um i took that decision i think the first month i got into a teacher training college okay at Federal College of Education Special, because when I found myself as a teacher, I look at uh, past my teachers in secondary school, primary school, their life was not, was not what I want to emulate. I, I agree with but that. But I said, rather than teaching in primary schools or secondary schools, I would rather teach at higher tertiary institution, higher institution. So that was when I made up my mind that I'm, going, I'm not going to teach in secondary school or primary school. And everything I've been doing since then has been in higher institution. So when um, you would later leave Nigeria and start teaching in South Africa, and uh, how did that come about? You know, how did you come to that decision? How did you decide that you're moving to South Africa to go teach? You know, so like first, when did you start teaching in Nigeria? Where or where did you start teaching in Nigeria? And then, when did you decide to go to South Africa to teach? And why? I've started teaching in Nigeria since 2012. In Nigeria, I've taught at a couple of institutions. I've taught at the Federal College of Education Special, where I said I graduated from. Yeah. I I taught at the University of Benin. Uniben. I taught uh, Uniben, yeah. 
I taught at um, University of Ibadan since 2012 till 2019. And then in 2019, I got an appointment in South Africa. So I had to leave for South Africa to teach special education at the Department of Educational Psychology and Special Education. And that's where I am currently. That's uh, in Durban, right? Yes. So now stepping away from the university life, or you can the answer can be can still be in the university. When you arrived in South Africa, was that your first time when you went to South Africa to teach? Was that your first time in South Africa? Well, culture shock. Yeah, you're right. In South Africa, when I got to South Africa, I was um I was um I was shocked because the way manner of dressing were different from Nigeria. How do you mean? You get it? Yeah. You know, in Nigeria, our, our, you, the, especially the Zulu culture, when you're having um, the, what's it called? There's a festival they do, a um, maiden festival. Oh, oh yeah. yes, I get it now. They yeah. go, they go, they go shirtless, braless. I was like, you know, that was the first time I saw that. Like, how could grown up ladies be going out without putting on anything on their chest? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but well, later uh, I got to know is their culture. Yeah, yeah. But in, in Nigeria, I know, like, someone like, uh, well, yeah, we might not officially go out uh of nude but we still go out nude you know that in certain tribes during certain festi festivals too it just depends yeah, if yeah. you have been there at the festival i mean even, even like being in, <laughs> if, if, if for like chief tensi titles you know the men are not topless when you get you get chief yes, tensi titles, you yes. have to walk up to our basketball but not the women yeah but the, but the, the women. women the women are not officially nude but they are still nude only that they just use a white cloth to cover their chest. Their breast, yeah. Yeah. and But there are other places where you just literally put a cloth on the breast, like Okrika. When mm. a, a maiden yeah. is about to get married, you can tell that, that that's yeah. you see the whole breast. It's like, uh, no, they, mm. even Okrika, there's, uh, you walk around uh, shirtless. The woman walks around like, because um, it depends on the age too. But like, uh, not just only Okrika, I think Abonima and some other parts of the, uh, those Ijaz and mm -hmm. River Rhine areas. I happened to witness it once. But back in the days, I think it didn't matter the age. If you were getting married, okay. walking around the, the village or the city, to show that, hey, this, yes. this maid, she's, this one is gone. So take one last look at her. Look at the goods. <laughs> I say goods in quotes, but your people understand. <laughs> and so you see how Less. You see her topless, and she walks around the village. So we have our own things in different places, but I don't think we've always, we, we don't make that correlation. Like, oh, we, we, we just think there's only one part of Africa that does this thing. But I think everybody has their own thing that they do, but we just don't broadcast. Yeah, I believe everybody. Yeah. It, it's something that yes. there's, no, there's not much publicity around it, you know, because it wasn't until I witnessed the Africa one, um, the, yeah, it was around 2000 and. Yes, I was. I went. I, I was an events manager, so I had to go set up an event over there. And I was like, "What? What? Why is this young lady walking around shirtless? But she's dressed nice. She, she was in a festival outfit, and the, the, the guys playing the, the town crier is announcing. And so I'm like, it's, something is going on. What is this? So it's part of my culture I didn't even know of. But I'm not from River City, I'm from Bayosa. So it's different in Bayosa, you know. <laughs> so everybody got something different that they do. But I think sure, it's sure, one sure. thing that we, we kind of um, we make mistakes. Uh, we have misconceptions. I won't say mistakes. We have misconceptions about that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So well, it, for you're me, not wrong yeah. for having a culture. You're not wrong to have the culture shock. That's not, I'm not sure, sure, right sure, right. sure. But I just wish that we, we have, um, we did a better job at, 
educating him and showing everybody that this is not something that's secret or in hiding, you know, that we have some, we have such traditions everywhere. And I think more people will be, wouldn't be like shocked when, 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 when it's, when they finally find out like, what this, this happens or this goes on, you know? So, yeah, but I'm, so I'm, I'm glad you, you got to witness their culture. So you, you, you are in Zululand proper, right? Yes. Yes. So entire, you, I think the entire KwaZulu Natal are Zulus. Okay. The uh, they are, they, they're like the largest Zulus. ethnic group there in uh, South Africa, right? If I'm not exactly, mistaken. Exactly, you're right. Okay. Exactly, you're right. You're right. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So going back to um, your focus in education, your. your I have this this question though that you know you you focus on the tertiary side of things you know teaching students at that yeah level level but don't you think it would be a good idea if you know Nigeria South Africa every even over here in America if we made sign language something that is taught to everybody at all levels from primary level elementary primary like it's made accessible to more people so that it's not just something that oh i have a child with disability that's when i start learning sign language you know because like if you live most people who i know like i don't know sign language i know like one or two things but most people who i know that speak those languages it's either apart from educators it's only people who like oh i have, my, I have a child who you know, it's because they have a child with that disability that they were forced to go learn. But I think it will also be good if, don't you think it will make more sense if we had it, we adopted a culture that implemented sign languages from childhood in our all our educational levels? Don't you think it will humanize people with disabilities? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good idea if every person, every citizen of a particular country, nation, location, learn sign language. Because sign language is just like any other language, like French, like German, yeah. like English. It has their own, it has its own uh, um, syntax, morphemes, and all that. And um, it's, it's, it's a sign language, it's a language that doesn't shout. Mm. In fact, if everybody can learn sign language, there won't be noise pollution. I, I never you thought know. about that, but that, that's a great, great point. <laughs> that was coming from, that will be coming from human beings. There won't be noise pollution, you know? In fact, um, about a few years ago, I wrote a proposal to a particular military, I mean, police barrack in Nigeria. Uh, they should let their policemen learn sign language such that you can meet a deaf at any particular point of your career and you should be able to interrogate the deaf without necessarily bringing a third party who is a sign language interpreter into the matter you know that is that and um, is even, in right there. even in hospitals all nurses doctors uh, health attendants surgeons they should be able to learn one or two aspects of sign language so that they can interact with deaf patients from the from the gate to the theater to the OPD to any part of the hospital, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's a language that everybody should learn. Although some nations across the globe have adopted sign language as official language of that country, for instance, the United States of America adopted sign language as an official language of the country. Um, France adopted it. Spain. Some other countries in Asia have adopted it. South Africa has adopted sign language as official language. Wow. But Nigeria is yet to adopt it as an official language. That is that is a great point that you raised there. And it's something that I think those of us who are able-bodied, we tend to overlook yeah. stuff like that and feel like, yeah, why do we need it? We don't need it, you know? Yeah, yeah, we are in yeah. a moment of emergency and then it's like, oh, exactly. I wish I knew. And that's never something 
that's good to say it. I wish, uh, had I known, you know, that, you know, those phrases. It's never, it doesn't come with a positive uh, reaction. So exactly. it's something that we should try and get ahead of. I, I had a previous guest whose sister was um, half deaf and she lost, well, she lost her hearing and he decided to learn. He used to volunteer at the school um, in Brooklyn here where she used, um, she used, his sister used to attend and he picked up sign languages as a kid going there to, uh, to see his sister. So that's how he started picking up sign languages. And he's a teacher today also, but he, he teaches um, like high school. I think he teaches high school kids in Spain. So it's something that, you know, when he talked about it then, I was like, you know, that, there's so much, so much stuff that I, I take for granted. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't even realize how much, how big a deal that is. Yeah. Because it's something that people, like a place like Nigeria, I just try to imagine someone trying to communicate like that. And I'm like, yeah, you know, you don't think about it because you, you, I don't need to. I'm like, yeah, I can speak pidgin English. I can go in and yeah. this. But somebody like that, they, they can't, they're not welcome in every space. So why no, no, no. for a way no. to make it more welcoming an official them. language that will be Every taught school. in schools exactly you know official language that will be official taught language. in schools and that's, that's, a, that's a language that if you make it official people won't fight over that we can't say oh it's your, you are trying to force no, these no, people no. to take over it's not from this part of the country it's no, no, from no. everybody everybody exactly. and then exactly. everybody benefits from having um, a language like that mm. official language so it's something that um, I will continue I will add that to my mantras of always advocating for going forward it's something that i've never i've never i've not done enough of and i will try to do enough of that i will try to advocate for that more forward and uh, that's why another reason why i appreciate the work that you do because it's uh, an easy job thank you yeah so um you when south africa when the pandemic started and uh what, what was that like you know being an educator how, how was that for you in teaching yeah life during the pandemic can in post pandemic cannot be like that like life pre pandemic that's changed seriously because the pandemic came to everybody as a shock and i would tell you to persons with disability had the greatest shock of the pandemic because especially the deaf, many of them were not aware of what was going on until they saw suddenly see people with face mask, nose mask, uh, don't touch me, physical distancing. So many people were worried, like, what is happening? What is happening? Except those who saw news, um, read on WhatsApp, but many people doesn't understand what pandemic was. So the pandemic became a kind of... Uh, I became teaching about the pandemic, so to say. Because I started telling the deaf community about pandemic, what they need to do, how they need to do it, basically in the sign language, because that's the language they understand better. Yeah. Do you get it? So, but the pandemic, of course, everybody went into isolation, the, the country were on lockdown, classes, physical classes were not continuing. So everybody had to go back to e-learning, e-learning model. So teaching online became something that is, we are not really used to in Africa. And um, many learners, many students have problems, mental health issues regarding online learning. You understand? Many people were not able to have this academic resilience towards learning, towards e-learning. And um, several challenges came up, several psychological challenges, psychosocial challenges, uh, especially for persons with disability, they experience more of uh, annihilation, isolation. Imagine a child that is um, being, that is, that have uh, occupational therapy or behavioral therapy ongoing and the pandemic comes in and uh, the, the therapist cannot work with the child again because I don't want to infect the child, no, I don't want the child to infect me. So for teachers, for uh, academics in special education, you know, the fear of uh, that the child I'm taking 
that is going through therapy. It's the, the fear that there will be a relapse in, be, in behavioral gain, in learning how to come gain, we're there. You understand? Yeah. And you know, parents were overburdened. Everybody were overburdened. A child that you have been saying, okay, for us, a child has been able to write one to 10 before the pandemic. We now struggle to write one to five right. because there was no reinforcement. Yeah. You know, the child has been doing speech therapy for, has is able to pronounce one or two words pre pandemic. When the pandemic came, came around, there was no reinforcement. That child will have a relapse and the, the work will have to be start all over again. You know, so it's a stress on therapies, it's a stress on teachers, it's a stress on everybody, even the parents. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't look at that uh, aspect of it. Yeah, that's why that's why I have to have you on the podcast, man, because it's it, it, it's a lot different hearing from someone in the field that it affects, you know, because a lot of us can just assume. And then we, we don't we don't there are certain aspects that we don't see, and on or except we experience it, then we get to realize that you know these people have been affected, and these are the ways that it affects sure. other people. So yeah, so it's it's this that's that's why I'm I'm just like man, I hope everybody gets the vaccine, and we, we, because that's the only way we can just move forward, and people just need to take precaution and stay safe, you know. So, um, with that being said, have you been, do, do you consider moving away from like South Africa to a different continent or um, like if a HBCU in America offered you an opportunity, would you take it or do you, are you deep in the, your program in South Africa? You, 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 you're sticking there for a while. Well, for me, I believe uh, learning is a process, a continuous process. And uh, one of my hobbies is traveling. Mm. I love the adventure of traveling. L- getting to know new things, knowing new people, meeting new people. Uh, so I wouldn't mind to go into explore other places. You know, yeah. currently, um, I'm looking towards uh, Malaysia. One oh. of the universities in Malaysia. Fascinating. Um, so, if I have another opportunity from that side of the country, definitely I'll move. Because life is not even life is not static. If you learn what you have learned from one culture, you can you learn again. You relearn. You learn and you relearn. And that is what you can make you, yeah, like you say, yes, I know this part. I can talk about this part. I can talk about this part. That is that is where the knowledge is. You know, back in my ignorant days, I used to say, well, not just me, but some of my group, we used to say, people from Ibad do not like traveling. <laughs> like not, nah, not for me anywhere. anyways <laughs> not for me not for me so, it's beautiful that you gave that i love traveling but it, it was part of my ignorance because how many people from ibadan did i really know but you know it's something that we just assume well we meet a few people and say we just generalize like ah people from here don't like to travel they don't want to go anywhere but um it's I agree with you i, I believe in that mindset too that you know you you, you learn a lot when you travel you you gain more knowledge and you also bring to the places that you go to you know so you say it's not like so it's a win-win situation it's not like it's only the place it's a win-win it's a symbiotic relationship you they, they benefit from having you mm. there too so it's, it's just like south africa has been exactly from having you in there and the university is benefit uh, just as you are benefiting from the university too so it's both of you benefiting from each other so let's not only just focus on uh um your your educational side, your work that you do, um, you know, you've given me plenty of your time, and I appreciate that. So let me, I'm going to keep you here forever because I know you have stuff to do. But there's some fun things I would like to jump into before it's uh, um, too late. Um, being that you've been to a few places, tried met mingled with a few cultures, 
What, what, what is your favorite food that you've eaten so far? And where does it come from? Your favorite cuisine? I think my favorite food has come from South Africa. What? Outside, yeah. Outside this is Nigeria. the first time I'm hearing that. South Africa got hey, This is new. Oh, my, my South yeah. African buddy, gonna, he going to be laughing at me now. Like, oh, man, this is... What is this food called? I need to know. They call it putu. Putu? Putu. Mm. Mm. I'm, I'm thinking if I've heard of it. My brother-in-law lives in... Uh, where's my brother-in-law live again? That guy, that guy, that guy. One Wakajibe guy. It's in uh, Benoni, Benoni or whatever that place is called. But yeah, that guy gave me all, all the misconceptions that I was South Africa. That I came from that guy. He's <laughs> 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 more South African than Nigerian right now because he's been there since, what, 92, 93, 91, 92. Wow, he's in South Africa he, now. He, he speaks how many of their languages there. Like, yeah, yeah, that guy. That guy. I don't even know if you speak in German. He speaks all the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. what do you call the food again? Putu. Putu. So, Putu. what was it? Was it made of? Yeah. I think it's made of maize. Oh, it's like they have a lot of maize-based meals. Maize meal. They have so many maize meals. Yeah. Because I also heard they have a, a meal called pap too. Yeah, they have a meal called pap pap. Yeah, it's pap, not like pap is pap. also made from maize. Yeah. No, it's not from a, it's not like our pap. That pap is like uh, semolina. Their own pap is like semolina. Yeah, so I had. So I had. Yeah, my, my good friend, she's a, she's a medical doctor um, in um, close to Cape Town. She's a, she's also been there for over 10 years. Uh, Amadou Bello graduate. Okay. Yeah, so she's, yeah, she, she's also South African now. So, yeah, she's, uh, yeah, she, 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 she gave me some of that info. I was like, yeah, well, every time I keep hearing this pop, pop, pop. And I was like, wait, 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 wait what you got? You guys got pop? They're like, yeah, it's not the same like yours. You guys got something different. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Puto. Hmm. I love that. So what about music when it comes to dance? Because you can't tell me you don't dance. Even if you hide in your house and dance, but you dance. So well, if music. you have to dance. Wait, wait, wait. There, there, there's, a, there's a trick question. There's a trick question. It's not, I won't make the question easy okay. for you just like that. So we want you to dance for at least one hour. At least one hour. I know one hour is too small for you. But as an Ibadan man, you probably dance five hours straight. But let's say one <laughs> hour, you know. And for the one hour, we need three artists that will keep you dancing for one hour straight. So who are the three artists that you go to? Yeah, I will go for one, Davido. Hey, this man, this man, he, 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 he didn't deny his man. He went straight to his man quickly. <laughs> then I'll go for Flavor. Ah, went to the East. Flavor, I haven't heard any new then song for Flavor. Who? Then, and Simi. Simi, Simi. Simi, Adekule Gu's wife. Oh, that's his wife? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know this. But I don't really know most of Adekule's music, to be honest. I don't think I listen, I've listened to his music. But uh, Simi. What? No South African. I was like, this is my South African food. There must be South African music there. And now nah, nah, it, it came to me. Uh, music, Sarah, you just went, Sarah, Sarah, you went 360. You just did 360 tones. Like, I'm here for the South African food. But I mean, that sounds like a little bit like me. Yeah, because everywhere I go, I'm there for the food. Just remember, I'm here for your food. Eh? You got food, I'm here. <laughs> you, get the music, you, just well, you know, South, Af yeah, 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 South, South African music, South African music is um is somehow language, you know, language barrier. I don't really understand. Language, language don't stop language. me from dancing, though. but but, is Ziwa, that's yeah, my no, no, no. but I love I love this music, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Oh, that song, oh, that song everywhere, man. Yeah, we can't it's count everywhere. that African song anymore, we can't count it. It's a global was, song. It's a global song. You can't count it anymore. It's too. It's, it's gone. It's too. It's, it's been taken mm. from Africa. It's. It's like yeah. Yeah, it don't belong to them anymore. <laughs> it's like it's like well, the African the queen no longer belong to Nigeria. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, one thing I've observed with the little I've traveled is that um, I observed that many. Part of especially African nations, yeah. they listen to Nigerian music. Oh yeah. It's not just Africa. When I was in uh, Bahrain, when I got deployed there, 
That's when uh P Square and uh Flavor Flavor uh, yeah uh, uh no no uh, was it that of uh the, the uh Ashewa remix and uh okay. chop money chop my money from P Square yeah, chop my those, money yeah yeah those two songs were huge in Bahrain every club yeah and this was yeah. they, they used to have African nights. They didn't even play it mm-hmm. on African. It was regular club nights. So just be playing those. Yeah. Like, everybody was dancing white Arab. I was like, what the hell is going on here? They dancing on this. <laughs> you know, I, I was surprised too when I was in East Africa. Sometimes ago, I got to Kenya. I stayed about three weeks in Kenya. Then when I went into a club one day, they were playing Nigerian music. I said, wow, I want to the nights at the club. Nigerian yeah. music. I said, don't you have your own music? Then from there, I went again to Tanzania. Mm-hmm. When I got to Tanzania, it was Nigerian music from the airport. Yep. <laughs> you know, and that, I discovered that, you know, Nigerian music has gone. But that, that's the beauty about music, though. Music is, music is easy for music to cross borders. It's just that yeah. for a long time, people have been only stuck on playing just one, you know, like, okay, we'll only play this music from the world, we'll play American and we'll only play our music. And then if you notice, like even in Nigeria, Congo music was being play, was played a lot with a lot of, people don't realize that Congo music was the first one to break the borders. It was Congo. Yes. Congo. yes. A lot of us grew up on Congolese music. We don't like to admit it, but a lot of us yeah. grew up on Congolese music. Oh, Congolese music, yeah. We like to claim Nigeria, but it's not like ah, Congo was one that created the broke the past. Ah, Willo, no, even the far Willo, uh, like Sweet Mother, Sweet Mother is not uh, Sweet Mother. Is, that's from Congo now. Yes, yes, yes. You're that's right. from Congo. Uh, um, Papa, Papa Wemba, Papa, Papa Wemba. Um, there's this other. Uh, there's a whole bunch of Congolese music that. Used, um, a lot of them, I didn't realize how many my mom used to play. All our record, our our, our records were Congo, Congo. So, but it's always been the back of our minds. And then we only just thought it was only high life. And uh, you know, after, mm. and Afro beat that Nigeria and Ghana were just exchanging between each other. But the music, because there's one day I saw on YouTube that I don't know if you've known this, if you know, if you know this, that. Uh, there's Afrobeat like from the last time, right? When Fela was alive, mm-hmm. Afrobeat got to South America. That there's literally all of Fela's songs. They have it. Yeah. There are bands that re- made Fela's music in hey, Colombia, yo. Venezuela, Bruh. and a whole bunch of other South American countries. They sang it in some sang it in Yoruba, some sang it in Spanish. Wow. Yeah. If uh, I, I saw the video of your last manager talking talking about it, saying that we, we didn't get money from these people, we should have gone sue them and all that. <laughs> but we didn't have the music travel. No, no, we didn't have internet then, so we didn't have. You know, we don't know about these people playing it. It's not as big as exactly. You know, we just think that the last music was only staying in one part. No, because there are many times I meet somebody like I meet a taxi driver. Uh, the, the food truck, and they're like, Oh, wait, wait, I saw I was born in Nigeria. Oh, I listen to Fela, man. My father listen to Fela, and they just, they're everybody just once you start Fela, there are people who, who, they know it. School who are found Fela now, but they're people from the old school who knew Fela. Like, how did old school people know Fela? <laughs> yeah, somehow the music crossed. Same thing with a bunch of Congolese musicians. That if you if you use technology now, you'll be like, Wait a minute, this one from Congo. I thought it was Nigeria. Nah, it wasn't. <laughs> music has really crossed border. Yeah, so music is that thing that has always crossed. You know, there was a, 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 a female musician in Egypt that was banned by uh, the government not long ago. I still can't find her name. I need to find her name. And she based, she said Fela was her inspiration. Hmm. And she sings in Arabic. But her album, her album came out, they banned her. So I was like, this woman wow. was really a fella, a fella, a fella disciple. But the government said, no, 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 no. No, we never let this music come out. Always beautiful hearing how music crosses the border. That's why I can grow South Africa. Because, you know, uh, we had uh, Yvonne Chaka Chaka those days. We had Brenda mm, Chakalaka. Yeah, those were my two favorite South Africans. But now, Busiziwa. Ooh, that, uh, yeah. If I wasn't married, I would have gone to my Busiziwa. I just said, hey, don't even marry me. Make me boyfriend number two. That's fine. <laughs> Well, yeah, my bro, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate you. Love the work that you're doing and keep up the great work. Um, before I let you go, final question. 
what would you like to leave the audience with? It can be, you know, a line from your book that you've written or from an article you've written or from a book that you've read or is it anything you want to freestyle, you want to just leave us a mantra you live by. It's up to you. This is your moment. Freestyle. What would you like to leave the audience with? Well, basically, I'm going to leave the audience with the fact that um, at any point in time in life, we can be disabled. Mm. One can wake up in the morning with all your body organ functioning and go to bed being deaf or being blind due to so, so many circumstances. So, I would say do, do, do good to persons with disability at all times because you never can tell if you will be in that shoot tomorrow. As someone with disabilities, you know, I got my own disabilities, but it's not, you know, it doesn't, physically you can't see it. So mm. people don't consider me as someone with disability, except I tell you. And that is so powerful what you just said, you know, because even myself, I don't think about it until I admit, you know, because this is something that I struggle to admit, you know, coming mm. from my background, you, you're not supposed to admit that you have a disability. So that thing that's my first half of battle. With. So, yeah, that, that I, I just, man, I appreciate you for saying that, man. I appreciate you. So do, do, do you have any plugins people want to find you? Where, where, how can they reach out to you? Well, um, Typing my name on Google will just bring out many of my articles which I've written on disability matters. Ulufemi Adigun will give you, you see me on ResearchGate, on Google Scholar, on Poblon, and all that, on academia.edu. Nice. I'm, I'm visible on those sites. Okay. And I'll, I'll make sure I add those to the show notes. So please go check out the um, works of uh, Dr. Lufemi Adigun. Read them. They are worth reading. You learn a lot. You become better and you improve. And be good to people with disability. And, you know, be, be an advocate for people of, uh, with disabilities, you know, because exactly. you know, we all need to do better on that side of, of things. We need, we sure. Because they are humans. They are human beings, mm -hmm. and yeah, we we we, we can't we can't we can't afford to be to make them second class citizens because they, they all have something to contribute to. Exactly, we're all losing out by pushing them to the side. So thank you, my brother. Appreciate you always, and uh, everyone listening. Thank you for being with us. Hope to see you at the next episode, and keep the love coming in. Thank you for the privilege of your company. See you next week. Thanks for listening to White Label American. If you enjoyed the show, we'll appreciate if you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast from. If you have any questions, comments, or have someone who will be a good guest on the show, or you want to be on the show, send us a message at whitelabelamerican at gmail.com. And make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at White Label American. Thank you for your support.